Hey guys, welcome back to the One Piece at a Time Distilling Institute. I'm your host, Alan Bishop, on the channel where we mess up things so you don't have to. So today we've got uh, another viewer question. By the way, if you have a question, feel free to ask via any of my social media or bishopshomegrown at gmail.com or even in the comments on YouTube down below. So today our question comes from my good brother, my good buddy, my good friend, all of those things, Brian Cushing of the Victorian Bar Room. Uh, if you haven't checked out the Victorian Bar Room, do yourself a favor, go to YouTube or social media right now, look it up, check out Brian. Uh, excellent, just wealth of information on Victorian style cocktails and uh, alcohol in general in the Victorian period. So Brian's question was sort of if I could outline, um, I guess kind of the, the, the timeline or the usage of rye or wheat. Now, I will also preface this by saying that my, my expertise historically is here in Southern Indiana. And for me, that question's a little wider than maybe the way that it came out. And if, Brian, if I'm incorrect in my interpretation of this question, uh, please feel free to, to correct me and, and I will answer the question again. For, so this video may end up standing on its own, who knows. Um, but when it comes to various grains in Southern Indiana, also Northern Kentucky, uh, very early on, uh, let's say in Northern Kentucky, late 1700s, uh, and Southern Indiana, obviously early 1800s, 1806 forward, um, what were people kind of using? What were their preferences grain-wise? So, um, Brian, you and I both have this kind of theory that we've talked about, this sort of, um, this theory of you use what you have as a distiller at that time. And I think a lot of other distillers have that same mindset, that there were no real, like, set mash bills very early on. It was very much, uh, you know, your distillations were a result of how good or poor your harvest was with each individual crop. So, Early on, I don't think that, you know, people were really making, say, 100% rye whiskey unless they just had a great rye crop that year, right? Um, I also don't think they were probably real particular about the way they cleaned out their bins or their wagons. And so even if they were making, in their mind, 100% rye whiskey, there may have been 5% oats still laying in that wagon or in the bin, or there might have been some wheat in there or even some corn in there, right? Um, it very much was a subsistence level sort of thing and a way to save the farm crop. Uh, very early on. Now, obviously, there were exceptions to that, and there were some pretty large uh, distilleries in southern Indiana and in northern Kentucky uh, very, very early on in both states' history, uh, for sure. But here we're talking about on a more practical level. Now, here in southern Indiana, I can tell you the very first distiller we know of that came into the region, talked about earlier, uh, was a man named John Fleener. He was at least distilling by the fall of 1807, and he was known for two things, peach brandy, choice old peach brandy, and choice old rye whiskey. Rye was being grown pretty extensively in southern Indiana as an actual bread crop at that time and a whiskey crop. Now, it didn't last in southern Indiana very long because it wasn't a practical crop for most of southern Indiana. The old heirloom rye varieties get crazy tall, five, six feet. Um, they are very top heavy. They mature in June. And the problem that you have in southern Indiana in June is you usually get two or three freaks thunderstorms come through with pretty gusty winds and you'll lodge that crop out of the ground, lay it down into the mud, and you've ruined the crop. Now, sometimes that played in their favor if they could get to it in time and still find a way to harvest it and it wasn't laying in the mud and the muck, that rye might have germinated just a little bit. And that little bit of germination gave it some diastatic power, giving the distillers that were making cereal mash whiskeys at the time a little more enzymatic power, subsequently a little more alcohol off of that yield. But rye didn't last very long as a major commercial crop in southern Indiana. Um, now, interestingly enough, here in southern Indiana, because of the German population that we had in sort of the Six County Black Forest region, rye was actually preferred for bread over wheat quite often. And so by the time you get to more industrialized distilleries in the, in the Six County region in southern Indiana, uh, 1858 and forward, you do see them making corn whiskey or bourbon with a proportion of wheat as opposed to rye because they preferred to hold on to what little rye was grown here for their bread needs. That was their culinary um, sort of preference. They wanted that rye for the bread, so therefore the wheat works better in the whiskey and they're more than happy to get rid of the excess wheat that we grow because we do grow quite a bit of wheat and always have um, to use it for whiskey. Now, interestingly enough, Indiana and Kentucky both the second major grain that was grown up until 1870, which is about the time industrialization hits the distilling industry with, with the real widespread introduction of low rectification column stills, as you'll see in the large bourbon distilleries in Kentucky. Up until that point, the second major grain 
behind corn, grown in both Indiana and Kentucky, was oats. And if you were to go back in time and go back to pre-industrialization, especially back into the 1850s, 1840s, 1830s, you would see that a lot of what we would now define as bourbon whiskey was using oats. I have also seen basically oat whiskey mash bills, you know, upwards of 70% oats and then malt, and then sometimes even malted oats in both states, which is pretty impressive in my opinion. Um, and we're just now sort of seeing that come back around with artisan distilleries, right? I mean, my own product that I make, uh, I've got Lee W. Sinclair four grain bourbon through my distillery. You know, it's got some oats in it. Now I came up with that before I knew the history of oats or before I knew that oats were a thing in Indiana and Kentucky. But I can tell you that oats go way back in distilling. That was, oats were all a part of what was considered, what would be considered proto-Scotch whiskey and proto-Irish whiskey. And sometimes malted oats were a part of that as well. So, Brian, I don't know if that really kind of answered your question. I feel like I maybe kind of danced around it a little bit. Um, so if you need a more specific answer or it wasn't exactly the question you were asking, please feel free to let me know, brother. I'm always glad to, uh, to answer any question you have. And uh, it's always a pleasure to work with you, man. Y'all have a great one. I love you. I'll catch you soon. Don't forget to reach out to me. Any of my social media. Um, also, bishopshomegrown at gmail.com and or in YouTube in the comments. I'm losing my voice a little bit. Uh, and so we're going to call this one the last one for the day. Later, guys. Love you.